Well, good morning. morning. How are you all this morning? I'm good, thank you. It's good to see you all here. Well, we're continuing through, we're concluding this week actually, our mission series. And this week we look at the sort of the goal, the sort of the, the prize, what it is that we're chasing after, what it is that we want. And we started with calling everyone. We could almost say, call everyone calling everyone. For the first step is to take the next step. To be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be a part of the body of Christ. Not just a few, but everyone has been designed. God has called us to be a part of his body, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And remember that we do not merely encourage one another as brothers and sisters to do this, but we call everyone. Just as the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22 When the king sent out the servants to go on all the roads to gather everyone he could find into the wedding hall. So we go out and call everyone. And then we thought about growing together and we saw the image of a tree. A tree that we did not belong to but now we belong to by the work of Christ. Now we're growing into the family of God, into the body of Christ. And there's movement, there's development here. We know we're not going to be like Jesus overnight, that it's a process, that we grow in it. Step by step, day by day, with God faithfully working in and through us. And it's something we do together. We cannot grow alone. We need one another. We need a community with the the kindness, accountability, generosity, and so on. And we press on together, growing closer to Christ, growing closer together together. Together, together. And all of that, the calling everyone, the growing together, the being the hands and feet of Jesus, the serving with our gifts in the body of Christ, bearing good godly fruit, all of that begins to and points us to the abundant life of Christ. Something we have, something we grow into, and something we desire more and more of. And so with that, before we turn the scriptures, I'd like to just pray for us if you'll join me. Father, I thank you for this morning that you have gathered us together as your people. Father, I thank you for the countless reasons we have to sing songs of praise to you. You are so worthy, so good, so faithful, so kind to us, Father. I pray that as we open the scriptures, as we consider, we think about the life that you bring to us, the abundant life of Christ, I pray that you would work in our hearts, that you'd show us what it is that you'd have for us that you'd place in us a desire for more and more of it, that we'd refuse to settle for anything less than your best for us, Father. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're starting in John. We're going to go to verse 10 of chapter 10. It says there, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. In verse 10, Jesus contrasts himself with the thief. The thief who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. His intentions are destructive, to take away from. Jesus, on the other hand, comes that we would have life and have it abundantly. Jesus does not here, though, launch into a sermon about what that looks like, about what the abundant life means. Instead, he makes three points that we'll look at about the abundant life rather briefly. The first is that Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd. All this talk of sheep and shepherds points us to Psalm 23. That is the description of the abundant life, and I believe that those around Jesus would have connected that easier than we do. And we're going to turn to Psalm 23, but first let's look at two other things Jesus says. The next is that Jesus describes, he explains that he lays down his life For his sheep. 
We cannot have the abundant life of Christ without the sacrifice of Christ. He's the good shepherd. He's also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who offered himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's the facilitator of the abundant life. He's the means to it. He's the guarantor of it. Without him, all we would have is death. But with his death, he brings us abundant life. And the third thing that Jesus describes after declaring that he brings the abundant life is an intimate knowledge that he shares with his sheep. He knows his own and his own know him. As Christians, we must pursue this growing knowledge of Christ to wrap our arms further around the abundant life of Christ. If we stay content, We will not go any deeper into this abundant life. I love that song we sang last week, if you remember. The line says, I've spent my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are, the greatness of our God. God is so much greater and bigger and better and wider than we can even imagine. And we pursue that deeper intimacy, a deeper understanding of him and his ways. Right? This is something that we grow together in. Laying aside our ideas of who God is and what we think he ought to do and humbly accepting who he is in all his glory as his ways are higher than ours. With the important place of Jesus in the abundant life established, we can now turn to our wonderful description of what it looks like, what it means to enter into and to walk in the abundant life of Christ. And so we're going to read Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Yeah, we really need three or four hours here. But you guys have some plans, so we're going to go as fast as we can here. The first thing we see, we're going to kind of just work through it phase by phase because I talked to Evan and I couldn't get four hours. And the first is that the abundant life needs a shepherd, right? We see that the Lord is my shepherd. We cannot walk into the abundant life on our own. It's not something that we can find by chance or by effort or stumble into. It's something that we are led into and that we are led through. Jesus is our good shepherd. And he leads us in the way that we ought to go. As we just saw in John 10, he protects us and he lays down his life for us. That also means that the abundant life is a place where we are in the care of another. The Lord is our shepherd. And that means we need to surrender our life and surrender our kingdom into the kingdom of God. The truth is that If we continue to rule our lives, if we continue to build up our kingdoms according to our own ideas and desires, then the Lord is not our shepherd. For when we hold on to our kingdoms, we deny our need for a shepherd. We try to be our own shepherd. And if that is the case, then all the beautiful truths that follow in this psalm will not apply. We will not be living in the abundant life of Christ. For the first step is to truly and honestly come to a place where we surrender, where we surrender our kingdom to his, and then we enter into the abundant life described here. Then we live in the with God life that we were created for. Next, I shall not want. And we could talk about what, what we want and what we need and the difference between the two, but what this phrase is ultimately getting at is that in the abundant life, With the Lord as our shepherd, we lack nothing. In the abundant life of Christ, not only in the future, but we have not ever lacked and we do not presently lack. For the disciple's life is a life without lack. At no time have we ever lacked anything. 
while we've been in the flock of Christ. And we never will. This truth is not only comforting, there's also a little bit of convicting there. Because if we're honest, we seem to complain an awful lot for people who lack nothing. We can fall into the habit of not appreciating what we've been blessed with or, or looking for more or for something else. That goes all the way back to the garden. That's what Adam and Eve did. They weren't grateful. They weren't content. They took the fruit. The ninth and tenth commandment are about not coveting what belongs to your neighbor. But the truth is we lack nothing. We have everything we need and more to live thriving lives. Thriving lives in Christ. We have everything we need to grow to be like Jesus, to enjoy him, to glorify him. These are our eternal pursuits and in them we lack nothing. The abundant life does not mean that everything will go perfectly in our lives. It doesn't mean that we will necessarily have all of this stuff. It doesn't mean we'll be wealthy or prosperous. It doesn't mean that we'll necessarily have anything at all. But even in the midst of brokenness and hurt, despite any and all suffering that we experience, the Lord is our shepherd and we lack nothing in his abundant life. He's sustaining us, caring for us, providing for us. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Part of that phrase that stands out to me is, is that word makes. What does it mean that God makes us? Does he force us? You made me do it. Do we have a choice? In the Hebrew, the word is rabats, which means to lie down. The word makes comes into our English translations because of the tense of the verb. It's the hiphile, which describes causative action. So it's not the forcefulness that we can read into the word makes when we read it, but rather our good shepherd does something that causes us to lie down, to willingly and freely lie down in green pastures. He doesn't make us, but when we reflect on who he is and we spend time with him in scriptures and in prayer and we see all the ways that we have been blessed and how faithful he has been, then that causes us to worship and we desire to spend more and more time with him to lie down with him in green pastures what does a shepherd do that causes a sheep to lie down in green pastures a shepherd simply leads the sheep into green pastures and then the sheep does what a sheep does and eats the grass and then the sheep comes to be full and satisfied and lies down And so it is with the Lord, our shepherd. He leads us to green pastures. Again, the surrendering means, or the abundant life means to surrender to his leading, allowing him to be our shepherd. And so he leads us to green pastures. And when we find ourselves in green pastures where we can eat our fill, where we'll be satisfied, where we can find rest. Because the abundant life of Christ comes from who he is. For he is good, he is patient, he leads us in good places. He has good in mind for us. He wants us to rest in him. That's what the yoke of Christ brings to us. In the abundant life of Christ, we take on the yoke of Christ. We learn from him, we're led by him, and we find rest. He leads me beside still waters. In case we've missed the point about being led by our good shepherd, again, we see that he leads us. If we're out in front, if we're going our own way, if we're trying to do the leading, it simply will not be still waters that we're walking beside. We can all see times in our lives where we have experienced that truth, where we've gone our own way, and we found ourselves in choppy waters or worse. But even then, God was faithful, wasn't he? And so we remember that the still waters of the abundant life come from submitting to God's leadership. That's not often easy. In America, we're all about our rugged individualism, being autonomous and strong, independent. We want to depend on the fewest amount of people for the fewest amount of things. We sometimes even convince ourselves that we don't need anybody for anything but we are completely dependent on God for all things, whether we acknowledge it or not. 
and we do well to acknowledge it, to remind ourselves of our dependence on him and to lean into it, to trust him, to submit to him. For he leads us along still waters. In our most anxious moments, when the world, when our thoughts about the world, the situations we find ourselves in are the complete opposite of still, we can remember that God is leading us through still waters. We can remember Jesus calming the sea and trust him to calm ours. We will still have to go through that difficult time, but with him they can be but still waters. For to be led along still waters does not mean that our lives will be free of suffering, conflict, or difficulties. These things are still present in the abundant life. There will be hard days. We will often be uncomfortable and we will suffer. But the still waters of the abundant life mean that we can have peace. We can be at ease. We can be confident in the midst of suffering and discomfort. For our shepherd leads us even when the waters are tumultuous, and he stills us. Thinking about our sheep again, there's only one way to lead a sheep besides still waters. You can easily lead a sheep to still waters, but how do you get a sheep to walk alongside still water without stopping to drink it? That sheep must already be satisfied. That sheep isn't thirsty. That sheep does not need to stop because it's completely satisfied. That sheep has had living water and will never thirst again. He restores my soul. Our soul refers to the deepest part of who we are. And as the deepest part of who we are, it necessarily includes all of who we are. Our hearts, our minds, our our physical bodies, our relationships with others. For God to restore our soul means for God to do something in the deepest part of who we are, which means God's doing something in our hearts, minds, bodies, and relationships. It means that he is reaching us at a level that changes everything. God does not just change one part of us. What God does in us changes every part of everything. He restores all of us. To be restored means to be healed and to be reintegrated. It means for our brokenness to be put back together again. It means to be transformed so that our ways become God's ways, inch by inch. It means for us to desire the things that God desires. It means for our thoughts to become closer and closer to the thoughts of God. It means for our bodies to move in the same rhythm as God's movements in the world. For us to love God and neighbor with the love of God. And so the abundant life is about change. It's about the work that God does in every corner of our lives to make us more and more like Christ. As we grow into deeper intimacy with Christ and more like Him, we grow deeper into the abundant life. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Again, we have our shepherd leading us, this time into paths of righteousness. Righteousness is not something we can generate any other way. God is righteous, and we are far from it, to say the least. But because of the sacrifice of Christ, we can be righteous. God changes our legal status from wicked sinner to righteous saint. But he also changes, changes us to actually be righteous in our words and in our deeds, in our daily lives. With restored souls, with God continually transforming all of who we are, we walk in paths of righteousness, which quite simply means we live righteously. We live as Christ would live our lives if he were us. Of course, we'll not always do so, But as we grow in Christ, as we step deeper and deeper into this abundant life of Christ that we see in this psalm, we come to be slanted, to to be angled towards the ways of God and towards paths of righteousness instead of against them. We also remember that this is for his name's sake, the end of verse 3 says. 
The abundant life is not about our own glory. Now we've seen many men and women with their faces on the cover of books speaking of a different sort of so-called abundant life. That's all about their glory and all about the stuff that they can accumulate. The abundant life of Christ is for his name's sake. In the abundant life of Christ, we do not take pride in our righteous behavior like the Pharisees did. We know that any drop of righteousness comes from our complete dependence on God. And we walk in these paths to bring him glory. For he deserves all glory, honor, and praise. Doesn't he? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There are so many things to fear in this life. Truly, there are whole industries that exist because of the things we have to fear. The media, advertisements, insurance salesmen, they thrive on fear, just to name a few. And there are so many people who are afraid of so many things. But in the abundant life of Christ, we can say that even though we walk through this world that is dominated by fear, We are without fear. The implication being that we can live without fear despite what's going on around us. Not because we're ignorant of the things to be afraid of, but because we walk in the abundant life of Christ. I recently read that anxiety is living as if God were not involved in our lives. The truth is that even if the worst were to happen in our lives, God would be there. And so it would be okay. Now that is an obviously difficult thing to do. Maybe that shows us how far we need to go growing into the abundant life of Christ. But since God will always be there, he will never leave or forsake us. He provides for us. He leads us. He does all the things we've been talking about this morning. We do not have to fear or be anxious. For the deeper we go into the life without lack, the more that becomes the life without fear. As we continually abide in Christ, we come to a place where we see we don't lack anything. And then we fear less and less. Which is related to the next phrase, for you are with me. For you are with me. If you were not also generous to give me all of these words in this time to describe the abundant life, we could have just looked at these five words here. For you are with me. The abundant life of Christ is the presence of Christ in our lives. Everything we've said this morning, everything that we say week after week hinges on the withness of Christ in our lives. He is God with us. That's why we can have his abundant life. That's why we can have a life without lack, for he is with us. He is working in us and for us. It is his abundant life. He brings it to us. He makes the way for us to enter into it, and he leads us deeper into it every step. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Here we see that the result of the rod and the staff is to comfort us. We've already spoken of our need to be comforted. So often the rod is described as a tool of of violent and harsh discipline that would not provide any sort of comfort to any sane person. But we see that the discipline of our shepherd brings us comfort. The primary purpose of the rod in our shepherd's hand is not to be used towards us, but for us. A shepherd would use its rod to ward off dangers, to ward off the lions, tigers, and bears that come after us. The rod reminds us that we can count on God to keep us safe and to protect us. While his staff is there to guide us, when we start to wander as we're prone to do, our shepherd takes his long staff and gently nudges us back to his path. It restores us to our proper place of journey with our shepherd. Together, the rod and the staff comfort us because they are symbols of the safe place where we have nothing to fear. He brings us to a place where we can have the freedom to not worry, to not fear. 
When so much of the world is caught up, enslaved to fear and worry, Christ brings us to a place where we have the freedom to not worry. To a place where we realize God's generosity, where we do not lack anything. Until then, we will think of God as harshly disciplining us and keeping things from us. Only when we enter this place, Knowing God's strength and protective care are enough for us, can we enjoy his overwhelming generosity, knowing he is working for our good and giving us every good thing. You will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. To prepare a table means much more than setting up a folding table in the wilderness. That's where... David spent a lot of his time as he wrote this song. To prepare a table speaks to a meal, a full-on meal with all the fixings. God is hosting a Thanksgiving meal, a feast in the very midst of trouble, in the presence of our enemies, even in those seasons when everything is against us, even when it seems that we have very little, that there's very little reason for hope or joy. Even then, God prepares a table for us. God prepares a meal with all the fixings. God blesses us with more than we can imagine. For we've already seen, we know from our lives, that when we trust God for our daily bread, He gives us more than bread. We started with describing a life without want. Now we see a life described as having more than we could imagine even in situations we couldn't imagine. And and it is in the presence of our enemies, which means that our enemies are there to invite to the table. The psalm doesn't say, you prepare a table for me while my enemies are looking for me or while they can't happen to find me, but in their presence. For the abundant life of Christ is not to be hoarded. This is the way that we learn from Christ who laid down his very life for ours. And so we invite our very enemies into the abundant life of Christ themselves. We serve them as Christ has served us. God blesses us despite our enemies, but not to spite our enemies. God blesses us so that we could bless and would bless our enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. When we pause and honestly consider all the ways that God blesses us, we are left with this one conclusion. My cup overflows. And truly, God does not merely fill our cup. He overfills it. A cup can sit full for days. Right? You can fill it right to the brim of it, as children like to seem to do, and then try to walk it into the other room. Right? You can fill it, and it will sit full. But it cannot continue to overflow without continuing to be filled, right? A cup overflows when you pour it past its brim. And it's overflowing when you continue. What a beautiful picture of the abundant life. He continues and continues and continues to fill us. Being filled by God would be such a blessing in and of itself, wouldn't it? That's more than enough. But God goes beyond that. Our cup overflows continuously. He is constantly attentive to us and continuously blessing us so that our cup overflows. And catch the way this connects back to everything. That means we have plenty to share with others. That means we don't have to worry about anything. There's nothing to fear. We have enough. We shall not want. We lack nothing. We don't have to worry about what we have or don't have because we know that God is still pouring into us. He didn't give us our fill and walk away. He's still pouring and still pouring. Our cups cannot even hold all that God is blessing us with. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I told you we need three or four hours. I could spend three or four hours just right here. I could talk about this last verse all day. As we enter into the abundant life of Christ, we come to realize that goodness and mercy follow us. Can you look back in your life and see 
the goodness and mercy of God following you? No matter where you go, no matter which direction, His goodness and mercy follow us. As Allison Willard explains that, that all of this means that the world is a perfectly safe place to be. Watch the news t- tonight and think about that when you turn it off. If we have understood this psalm, then we are left with that conclusion, though. For in the abundant life of Christ, we come to realize that we are exactly where Christ wants us to be. We are being led by him, and it's his presence that changes everything. That describes where we're going. This is the life that we desire for each one of us. This is what we are growing towards. This is what we're calling everyone into. This is the life we are called to share to the world. And so let us grow together in this. Let us seek first the kingdom. Let us allow God to work in our hearts so we bear the fruit of Christ-like character. Let us be engaged in works of service, being the body of Christ, serving one another, serving the world around us so that we can see and enter into the abundant life of Christ described here. This is what we mean when we say that we are calling everyone to grow together into the abundant life of Christ. This is what we want for each other. This is what we want for the people we don't even know yet, for the people that we haven't got to come and worship with us, the people that don't know Christ and don't know the things we've just described here. And so this is why we must gather week after week while we gather together to remind ourselves of these truths. This is why we must connect into each other's lives to support and to encourage each other towards this end. This is why we must grow, to go deeper into the abundant life of Christ, to be made like Christ. This is why we serve, for we see how Jesus has served us and we share his love with one another. And this is why we go, for as our life overflows with these blessings, how could we not call everyone else to come inside of it? Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, you are quite simply too good to us, Father. If you were to fill our cup, that would be more than we could even imagine, Father. More than we could even think to ask for on our boldest day, Father. But instead, our cup overflows. We lack nothing that even in a world that creates reasons to fear that we have no reason to fear to worry for you are with us you comfort us you guide us you lead us you protect us you restore us you change our hearts minds our bodies our relationships to make us more like jesus father help us each day to remember the abundant life we have with you to not get distracted by all the things that distract us, but to lie down with you in green pastures, to walk beside still waters with you, Father. Help us as brothers and sisters here to link arms and pursue the abundant life together, not settling for anything less than your best for us, Father. And help us to see all the things we have to share, all the things you bless us with, and send us out to the roads, Father. Send us out like the king to the wedding feast. Send us out to bring everyone inside into your abundant life, Father. Would you just have your way with us, Father, and be glorified through every word and every action we say and do. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.